Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker. As we do at the 10 o'clock hour on the last Monday of every month, we have an exceptional voice of experience for an unprecedented, for an unprecedented need, Peter Rosenberger, talking in this Caregiver's Hour. For more than 30 years, Peter has personally traveled the path of family caregiver. Through this journey, Peter has discovered a caregiver can not only survive, but thrive in oftentimes grim circumstances. In an unparalleled journey with his wife, Gracie, Peter has navigated a medical nightmare that's mushroomed to 80 major operations, including the amputation of both of Gracie's legs below the knee. These difficult experiences led Peter to work with more than 80 treating physicians in 12 hospitals, seven medical insurance companies, medical bills soaring to more than $10, millions, $10 million. All these circumstances resulted in Peter developing a firm grasp of the health care issues faced by families with disabilities. Since 2013, he's carried his message of health and hope for the caregiver to the airways, hosting his own weekly show on iHeartMedia's news channel 1510 WLIC in Nashville, Tennessee. And in September of 2017, he took his radio show into syndication through the Truth Network. In, a, in addition, his Your Caregiver Minute features on more than 380 stations. You can find him at Caregivers with Hope or their ministry, Standing with Hope, which provides prosthetics for people in third world countries who have a desperate need for the recycling and the reuse of prosthetics from America being used in foreign countries. He's the author of Seven Caregiver Landmines and How You Can Avoid Them, which is just his latest book out on the market. Peter Rosenberger, welcome to Revealing the Truth. Well, thank you. The month flies by, doesn't it, Eric? It does. It does. Yeah. You just came back from uh, almost an entire month in Montana. Uh, actually, yes. And we, we did, and it was, um, uh, it was a great time. We go out there and stay at my wife's family's place, uh, gives her a little bit of a break from the humidity of the South, and it's easier on her arthritic joints and body that's been broken so many times with all this stuff. And um, just she loves the cold, dry air. And, well, the, the, the pictures are extraordinary of her <laughs> skiing, of her uh, doing snowmobiling. it. Yeah. Snowmobiling. Uh, the the two, of, two of you out there just living it up. She, co she comes alive out there, and uh, I'm grateful that her folks let us stay out there. And I can do my show from anywhere now and uh, technology. When we first started going out there, we were pumping in water from the creek and having to boil it to drink it. And that was over 30 years ago. And now I'm doing a show on 200 stations from up there. It's just uh, the technology is a little bit surreal of what we can do. But uh, I love it, and I uh, was able to do a good bit of writing and uh, so forth. Uh, it's I love the fact that I can work now from anywhere, um, which, you know, a lot of people, I, this is a side note, it has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but people, when, when you work out of your home office, everybody thinks, oh, you go to work every day in your pajamas and you just kind of take off whatever you want. The challenge for me is not trying to motivate myself to work. The challenge for me is to stop working because work is too accessible for me. And, um, and I work, uh, I rarely, rarely take a day off. I, I, a pastor friend of mine told me I need to really understand what a Sabbath rest means. But when you're a caregiver and you run your own business, businesses, what does Sabbath rest look like? You know, uh, when you're, when you're spent, when you spent a lifetime being Martha, how do you be Mary? <laughs> and, uh, um, so I, I have, that's, that's a challenge for me is to, what does a Sabbath rest look like? Now I will say this, Eric. When I was working out there, I had my computer set up in the on the table there, and then the afternoon sun would blaze in so bright in Montana. We were out there for actually a couple of months, um, and it would blaze in so bright that I couldn't I could no longer see my screen, and I knew it was time for me to stop work and go out on the snowmobile, and so <laughs> that that was my alarm that it said, okay, it's time to punch my clock a little bit. So I'd go out and ride around a little bit on and just kind of clear my head and uh, then come back and make dinner and do all the things that I do. So, uh, but that is, um, it, it was a time of great refreshing. And I think that's something that we as caregivers need. Uh, it's hard for us to take days off, but it is possible for us to take time off. And I'm also learning, and maybe you can, this is something you and I can delve into over the next several 
times we talk, the difference between sleep and rest. A Sabbath rest is not doesn't mean we just sleep all day on the Sabbath. It means we rest, and there's a state of being of rest in it. And um, I, I, I think I'd like to explore that word rest in the Hebrew of what it means, uh, because I don't think that as a caregiver, I, I grasp that very well. And I don't think a lot of caregivers do. I think we are so frenetic and resting from what I can cursory tell means just basically knowing that I can sleep in the boat in the middle of a storm because it's going to be okay. Jesus knew he was going to die, but he, but he knew also that he wasn't going to die in the water. <laughs> and so he could sleep on the boat. You know, so, it's, it's interesting you bring that up because you're in, <coughs> you're in full-time ministry. <clears throat> you have this prosthetics ministry. You are ministering to caregivers. You are also a, a musician, a uh, uh, trained musician. Your wife is a trained singer, uh, and so she performs, you perform. Uh, rest is... The, the way God describes it, it says, do no regular work. Right? That's kind of the phrasing. Do no regular work. It means whatever your vocation is, don't do it on that day that you're spending in him and with him. Now, for us in full-time ministry, everybody talks about burnout, burnout, burnout. You do too much. You know, I do three hours of live TV five days a week. And I'm out four nights a week speaking in churches. And I write books. This year, I'll contribute to three books and write the forward to a fourth book. Uh, this is not my writing year for me. This is my writing year for other people. Uh, and they say, well, you know, all you do is work. And, and I say, that's not true. The Lord redeems our time. And for I almost am, am more concerned for the working person that works nine to five in a regular job in corporate America, which I spent 35 years in, I, I had no concept of rest in the corporate world. Right? But resting in him and, and being a vessel, being in his presence, what you did in uh, Montana okay, was a sabbatical period of time even though you did your regular activities, you did them in a new setting, your attitude was different, your posture was different, Gracie's attitude was different, her posture was different. You entered into this place where she feels better, you guys have more fun, there's a lot more latitude. Even though you're doing the same things, you're doing them with a whole different uh, sense about it. There's, it. It seems less urgent. Yeah, and, and that, that environment does slow things down a little bit. And uh, you you stop for a moment and look at the pristine beauty and you think differently. You can't, um, you can't get immersed in the freneticness that sometimes we get in in these urban areas where I live in Nashville. And even though I don't live in downtown Nashville, I'm close enough to it that it, it's kind of, you, you can feel it on you. Um, but you, a, a sabbatical is a good word for it. And it's, um, you know, it's hard for us as caregivers. Now I've been doing this for 32 years. So I, um, I, there are, there are people out there. I know that said, well, we can't go to Montana. We can't do this. Well, I understand I could, I, for 32 years, I hadn't been able to go to Montana for a couple of months either. Um, and, and so we, you know, but, but most people don't have to serve as caregivers for 32 years either. So I, I think it's a state of mind, however. I think it starts with that and learning to be content with where you are. And, um, and it took a long, and it still does. I think I wrestle with that. I think I will probably always wrestle with that one. Uh, there's, a, um, there's, a, there's a constant tugging at me at that because it's hard for me to turn it off. Sometimes, and again, I get that, that, that feeling that I'm more like Martha than I am Mary. And I always thought it was kind of, I always thought Jesus was a little harsh on Martha. I mean, she was, after, after all, she was doing all the work. And I thought, man, Jesus, that's a little cold, man. That's a little hard on her. I mean, she's there. Y'all got to eat. Somebody's got to serve it and clean it up. 
And um, but you know, but it, but, uh, but what he was speaking to was balance. And I think that uh, if we go in Deuteronomy and we take a look at, in the natural, God says um, uh, a false balance is an abomination to God. Don't use two different standards of weights and measures depending on who you're dealing with. So he was telling the Jews, look, look if you're dealing with the Egyptians, you know, don't tip the scales so that you get a little bit more. Um, if you're dealing with this person, don't tip the scales so you're getting a little bit more. Don't show favoritism, you know, a false balance. So when we try to translate that to the natural, um, kind of linking that to the supernatural, you know, God wants us to live a balanced existence, okay? He doesn't want us to be one or the other. He wants us to find and strike that balance. And so, you know, as a caregiver, the balance is... The caregiving comes before other things in many cases because of the needs of whoever you're providing care for. So there's a motivator, a driving factor, but if you can provide caregiving with a better attitude, with, with words of, you know, we've been doing a lot. Uh, Dr. Gary Chapman has taken um, the love languages and worked with about seven or eight maybe even nine now, different authors on uh, uh, the, the love language showing appreciation, uh, the love languages of appreciation in the workplace, and different people that have a different way that want to change. Uh, actually, I think that uh, uh, love language for caregivers uh, would be an incredible project for you to do with Dr. Chapman because well, of, I had him on my show. He's he's he, he's very insightful about these sort of things. Very insightful. Well, how does that apply then? Let me ask you a question. I'm going to interview you today. Okay. <laughs> Kicking against the goats. Is it the same concept that you're that is that striving mentality that we get into? Is that where is that where this is? Is that where Paul was re referencing as well? Well, God has us down a path, and it's really, you know, the, you, it, it, the, the summation of that is, is, you know, resistance to what God's plan is only, only makes it more difficult, <laughs> only brings on more suffering. So, um, whole, wholly yielded unto the Lord is kind of, um, you know, you're a psalmist. So there are, are certain psalms, songs, or um, hymns which talk about yielding ourselves, surrendering ourselves. And that, you know, it's hard to kick against the goad is a concept of, of listen, you know, it's really, it, it's, it's, it's tough to resist uh, and go against what God's plan is. We see that the one we give the best example of it was Jacob wrestling with God that he refused to let go until he got the blessing. And that's, you know, then we read in James about, about perseverance and, and hanging in there and, and hanging there through the tough times. But you, you, can't, you couldn't make um, what happened to Gracie go away. No. And so it's it's a reality, and it and I think a reporter once asked me one time, "What's the hardest thing you dealt with as a caregiver?" And hands down for me, it's knowing what is mine and what is not mine to carry. And I think for me, I've overreached and try to carry things that just don't belong to me. And when I do that, I'm grasping hard, and you can just feel the tension. And there are seasons when I've had, and moments of clarity when I've had this ability to kind of, okay, I, I this is I, this is not mine. I can't carry this. I'm just going to have to sit here in the in the boat and and ride out the storm with you, Jesus, while you sleep, you know, kind of thing. And um, that's a hard place. It is. This, this is. It's not easy. Um, and it's not going to come naturally to me, and it's not going to come in a vacuum to me. I have to have that reaffirmation again and again and again from others who will remind me of this. I, I think it always comes down to um, accepting the sanctification journey because that, all this is is sanctification. Um, 
and and if we try to overthink it too much, but it's it's a sanctifying process for whatever reason, and he uses suffering as a way to do it. That's mm-hmm. his. I hate to say it this way, but it's kind of it's almost like the the the, the go to tool of choice that he uses in our lives is suffering on some level. And I don't particularly like it, don't particularly care for it, but he didn't ask me as a consultant. <laughs> so, um, and, and, and even him in himself, Jesus said he endured, I mean, you know, the Paul said uh, he endured the, uh, the cross for the glory set before him. And he learned obedience through suffering himself. I don't know where that scripture is, but that's, that's um, and so evidently that is the go-to tool. That is God's tool of choice in our lives, and with His own Son. That's that's hard. That's hard theology. Uh, I remember when uh, in the passage when Jesus talked about uh, the whole point of uh, eating flesh and drinking His blood, and His disciples came up to Him and said. Master, that that's a hard teaching. Right. <laughs> in, in today's vernacular, they'd be saying, "Dude, what are you saying?" <laughs> and um, and they didn't get the concept of it. But that's a uh, that's the journey we're on as caregivers. Um, when we when we can embrace that and say, "Okay, God is teaching me something through this. I don't particularly like it, and I don't think He requires us to like it. I don't I don't see that He said, "Hey, you're gonna you're gonna like this." You know, when when He um, uh, told Peter, he said, Satan's asked permission to sift you. And when you come through this kind of thing, knowing that this is not going to be not going to be pleasant. And uh, and that that flies in the face of a lot of our modern day teaching, I guess, doesn't it? That we want to be happy, happy, happy all the time, time, time. Mm-hmm. There's there's no life if there is no growth. So anything that's not growing is dying. Do- doesn't matter in what part of nature it is, if it is not growing, it is dying, okay? A tree, a plant, a vine, uh, a limb. Um, Our our, our bodies are constantly changing. Uh, If it's not growing, it's dying. Blood's not flowing to it. If it's not, our our fingernails, our hair, our, our, the cartilage of our nose, our ears. Over, Over the years, there are certain parts of our body that continue to grow slowly maybe but if you did, if you and I didn't trim our beards for a year right they'd be you know down to there so it would be a d- dynasty yeah it's exactly right <laughs> uh, so in God's economy if you're bearing fruit for the kingdom it's not that God's dissatisfied he just wants you to bear more fruit so he's going to come along and do what we do to the vine which is prune it all right, knockout roses. We're in the South. We have, you have knockout roses in Nashville. Okay, about every February 14th is kind of the standard. People will take a chainsaw and they will just take this huge bush that might be seven to eight feet tall and cut it down to about one foot off the ground. And it's just this gnarly, bare, spiky sticks coming out of the ground. But Two months from now, they're going to be two feet taller, and they're going to have big, fat rosebuds on them. And three months from now, they're going to be another two feet taller, and they're going to have these gorgeous blooms on them. And they're going to continue to go through that cycle till they get to the seven, eight-foot mark again, and you're going to come along and cut them back. But if you don't cut them back, over a period of time, they become gnarly, they start falling over, and they stop bearing flowers. They stop budding, or all of a sudden they become very small because it's all fighting for the same nutrients. It's all fighting for the same thing. So in, in the vineyard, if you don't trim a, a grapevine or an olive vine for seven years, it will stop bearing fruit. It's just mm-hmm. using all of its energy because it takes a lot of nutrients, a lot of the root system Right, to be able to produce fruit. So if, in fact, what happens is it's using all its efforts uh, to grow and just to keep expanding, it doesn't, it, can't, it doesn't have enough storehouse to produce fruit, so you cut it back. God does that with us for those of us that are bearing fruit. There's a season of pruning that will come, but it seems like things aren't 
aren't like, uh, they're, they're a little tougher. They're a little bit, God's got you kind of pressing up against a barrier, an obstacle. And, but that's a, a season of pruning. Okay, you might lose a couple of friends. There might be a little change in leadership. Maybe some, 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 some things happening here. Okay, this is live TV, so don't worry about the bell ringing. Sorry rain. about that. I get somebody just keeps calling me. That's it, and it must be important. Maybe it's a no, call. No, it's not. You know, <laughs> I used to stand in the pulpit, and when somebody's phone would go off, I'd say, we believe you should be called here to this congregation. <laughs> All right. However, well, I'm sorry about that. Never. I it, it everything is forwarded to my my mobile, so it's quiet. But on the house, if they're called the house phone, and I forget that I have a house phone in here, who uses a house phone anymore? Exactly, exactly. Uh, but if you're in sin, God's going to discipline you. All right, and that still comes along with the same same chainsaw. So how do you know, because they both hurt. I know when I go up to that rose bush with that big chainsaw and it sees me coming and it feels the chains cutting it, it I'm sure that if it had a brain, had a thought process, it's saying, I'm, he's killing me. He's killing me. All right? But three months later, it's a look at me. Look how beautiful I am. Look how productive I am. Look at the fruit that I've born. But if there's blight, if there's disease, if there's aphids, if there's whatever there is, and I don't treat that, which is the way God works with our sin, right? discipline. We don't know. If they both hurt. Okay, If I took seven dust and sprinkled this poisonous powder all over you, all right, which is what you'd have to do to a rose bush that's infected with aphids or bugs, uh, it would probably feel like you're killing it, but you're doing it for its benefit. So, you know, the author of the book of Hebrews says, no discipline feels good at the time. Doesn't feel good. It's not supposed to feel good. All right? But we have to look, and this is why he says you will know them by their fruit. All right? Because we're supposed to be fruit bearers and fruit inspectors. So, in you this know, as you say that, I think about with caregivers, because so many times they feel like because it hurts so bad, they're equating it with being punished. And because discipline and um, pruning feel the same, sometimes we get them mixed up and somehow think this is God's displeasure. Neither of them are God's displeasure. All of them are God's care for us. Um, he even when he is sprinkling the stuff on the rose bush to get rid of the aphids, he's not displeased with the the rose bush. He's displeased with the aphids, <laughs> right? And um, and I think that that's something. And it's and it's helping us reassess our view of God. I think there's when we go through these difficult times. I think there's this um, instinctiveness. Philip Yancey basically said this it's uh we're 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 saying that the ref made a bad call and and we're appealing to this cosmic referee that just messed this whole thing up like the basically the what happens with the new orleans saints going to the super bowl and god doesn't make a bad call but it certainly feels that way sometimes to us and we don't because we don't understand and i get that so many people are struggling under this burden and they're watching this and they're thinking well, what did I do to God would do this to me? You know, or, and, and, and unfortunately, that's reinforced by other believers. You See, know, and the, cha the challenge is, is, you know, do you trust God? Right? And it always comes down to that. It right. always comes down to do we trust him? Do we trust him? And, so, and how do we know if we can? And that's when it comes back to the cross. And... For the caregiver and for any believer, as we come across circumstances that are painful, our go-to response to God is, Lord, how do I get out of this? But that's not the question he wants us to ask. How many times, must... how many times do you see uh, on a television show, they say you're asking the wrong question. Ask me the right question and I'll give you the answer you're looking for. Oh, great wise one, what, what, you know, tell me the, the mysteries of life. He says, you're asking me the wrong question. 
The question God wants us to ask is, what do you want me to get out of this? Not how can I get out of this, but what do you want me to get? What can I get out of this? And the lesson, what a, the lesson from Moses. I mean, think about Moses' banishment. Forty years banished to Midian. He's gone. He's out of the picture. He was living the big life. Pharaoh's house had, had every treasure, every wealth. All right? But all of a sudden, his national, his Jewish heart kicks in. He sees a, a, a Jewish man being uh, beat up on. He impulsively kills the Egyptian. God sends 40 years. The man is now 80 years old before God calls him. Why? Because it took 40 years to get Moses out of Moses. Right. Well, I, I think from what I understand, and you, we can go into the, I know we're going to get to the bottom of the hour here, but uh, uh, the Jewish mind doesn't try to come up with the answers. The Jewish mind, from what I understand, it looks for better questions. Exactly. And, 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 if, and in nothing, nowhere is that more demonstrated beautifully than in Job, when at the end, God just questioned Job, and the answer becomes the question, uh, where were you? <laughs> when I, and and that's when you put your hand over your mouth because we 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 are so myopic and seeing it like this suffering just obfuscates everything about us we can't see anything but the pain and we need somebody to help us see the bigger picture a little bit to realize that there is something else going on and um and when we can't see anything else if we can just focus on what happened at the cross that in itself redirects our eyes and the question do you trust God then becomes, Lord, I'm in this circumstance and situation. Are you telling me you trust me with Gracie? You trust me with her care? You've given me this gift, this incredible blessing, because you've chosen me for such a time as this, that it is an honor that you bestowed upon me it is, a, it is a jewel in my crown. I, you, my friend, may not have thought that you have, have this gift of compassion, this gift of caregiving, but you had so much love for this woman that you went into this because you adored her, not knowing what it was you were getting into. But once you got into it and you began to navigate it, and you've fared very openly when you hit your own roadblocks and your own crisis of faith and your own dark night of the soul, you reached out for God. He grabbed a hold of your hand. You talk about you take your what hand and put it in his what hand? You, put, you take your scared hand. Well, actually, he takes his scarred hand and grabs our scared hand. <laughs> there you go. And, and that's, that's, that's a Peter Rosenbergerism. All right? And it's a picture that you paint that says that when I finally began to grab a hold of the magnitude of all of this, of how much I needed the Lord to be a part of this, that I could not do this alone, I could not do this without Him, that now it is this, this me plus God are the ones taking care of Gracie. And I know what, and, and you, you talk about it openly, you know what you own, you are working through, uh, it's almost like um, uh, being a hoarder. I, I own everything. Well, now I've got to start to shed. There's some things that really don't belong to me, and I've got too many of. And so I need to get out of this to find that balance of what belongs to God and what belongs to you. And how do you speak life into this marriage? How do you speak life into other people who aren't there? They're in despair. They're in trouble. They're at a crossroads. We're talking with Peter Rosenberger, author of Seven Caregiver Landmines and How You Can Avoid Them, along with Hope for the Caregiver. Uh, his website, caregiverswithhope.com, or their ministry website, standingwithhope.com, which is their prosthetics ministry. We're talking about caregiving, and the ultimate caregiver, of course, is God, who sent his only son for us and who is there as our uh, as Abraham said uh, the Lord will provide and what does that provision look like and how does that feel when you're faced with a situation such as this um, this is the journey not the destination 
and how do you navigate it with grace and dignity and still giving honor and encouragement and glory to God. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll rejoin Peter Rosenberger for the Caregiver's Hour right here on the Igniting Nation Broadcasting Network. We'll be right back. Not everything that makes the headlines has biblical importance, but many events that happen around the world do, and you never hear about them. Igniting a Nation is pleased to teach Revealing Prophecy every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. at the Marriott 280 in Birmingham. We will cover worldwide events and insider information that will connect the dots of what's happening around the world with biblical prophecy. If you happen to miss a class, we'll televise each week's class at 10 o'clock Central Time on ignitinganation.com and all our social media outlets. Copies of the teachings will also be available to purchase on our website at www.ignitinganation.com. The Lord meets you right where you are, and so does Igniting a Nation's new live streaming outlets. You can now watch Revealing the Truth, Revealing the Bible, and Prophecy Revealed simulcast live each Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 1 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on YouTube Live, Facebook Live, Vimeo, Periscope, and through our website, www.ignitinganation.com. No matter what device you are using, our program will automatically scale so you won't have to miss a single program. And if you happen to miss an episode, you can always subscribe to the Igniting a Nation YouTube channel and access over 1,000 interviews and never miss your favorite authors, special guests, and topics that interest you the most. There are lots of ways to see Israel, but nothing compares to seeing the land of the book and the people of the book through the eyes of two Jewish believers who can take you on a journey that will bring the entire Bible to life. When you join Rabbi Eric Walker and his number one rated tour guide, Edo Canaan in Israel, you'll experience incredible teachings, first class accommodations, and actually walk where Jesus walked. You will experience the Bible transforming from black and white into living color, and you will never see the Bible in the same way again. For more information, visit us at www.ignitinganation.com forward slash events. The Lord contends with what contends with you, and Igniting a Nation is committed to bringing to light each and every issue that faces a believer's life. Our live stream programming and teachings take you on a journey to finding biblical truth from a wide variety of experts who share their insights into a deeper walk with the Lord. We have assembled the most comprehensive panel of experts in the fields of prophecy, caregiving, healing from trauma, shame, and abuse, and so much more. We continue to expand our teachings and programming to meet your needs. We're committed to healing the nations with biblical truth. Visit www.ignitinganation.com to develop a deeper walk with the Lord and start your journey to a transformed life. The Bible commands us to study to show ourselves approved, but most study using Bible study tools and not actually studying the Bible chapter and verse. Igniting a Nation is pleased to present Revealing the Bible, recorded and taught each week before a live audience. We take you deeper into the actual Bible and verse in both Hebrew and English and connect the dots between the Old and New Testament. You can attend our two classes in Tuscaloosa and Birmingham or watch the program every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Central Time on ignitinganation.com and all our other simulcast outlets. For more information, visit www.ignitinganation.com forward slash events. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Peter Rosenberger, author of Seven Caregiver Landmines and How You Can Avoid Them. And he's a caregiver extraordinaire with over 30 years' experience <coughs> as a caregiver. Peter, welcome back to the program. Welcome back. Um, sorry about that. No, we were talking about, uh, in the break, about... Um, Really language opportunities. Language opportunities, <laughs> communication barriers, which is really what um, early on, uh, before we went live 
at the top of the hour, we were talking about um, speaking life into uh, the believer, uh, into the one navigating. Um, my daughter is, um, uh, her father-in-law to be had a stroke a number of years back, is wheelchair bound and lost uh, his ability to speak. Uh, his cognitive skills are pretty sharp and he can do with one hand uh, jigsaw puzzles and that's what he likes to do. Uh, and they live in Ohio and they have a place at the beach and so every couple of months and my daughter lives down at the beach uh, and every couple of months they come down to their beach place and visit and they have found a way to communicate where he can't speak but he can uh, because of their closeness and because of her commitment to be a caregiver to her husband she's found a way to understand his needs uh, and communicate with him and uh, I asked my daughter about it and and she said, you know, it's extraordinary, but there really is a language that they've developed together uh, that makes it so that she can maintain life. So they get in the car, they drive from Cincinnati all the way down to Florida. It's a two-day trip for them. You know, I make a stop along the way, and they've continued on with their lives in spite of uh, this, this stroke. He's 67 my age. Uh, you know, so we're polar opposites as far as, as health is concerned, uh, but um, both have a need for prayer, both have a need for encouragement, both have that need to communicate, uh, and we, we sometimes struggle for clear, concise communications uh, as your situation with your webmaster was. Well, that's what I told him. I said, now, look, I want you to put these exact words here and I looked at my web page and it had these exact words. <laughs> I was like, okay, we got a, we obviously have a, what, well, as Struther Martin said, what we have here is a failure to communicate. And uh, was the, um, was the issue on him or was the onus on me for that and communicating clearly and understanding from his point of view what it sounded like and I think that's something as caregivers we have to learn that we have to learn how to speak someone else's language you can't always articulate what's going on they they uh, you, when you have somebody who's nonverbal for example um, like your daughter's father-in-law uh, my my brother and his uh, wife have a daughter who's 30 with cerebral palsy with severe mental uh, developmental issues my cousin Meredith and her husband have a severely disabled daughter who's in her teens. These are nonverbal children, and you have to learn how to speak someone else's language. I think what has been comforting to me along my journey is that God speaks my language too. He doesn't require me to speak God. He condescends to me and speaks me. And um, I... Um, I, I, I've come to treasure that, that he will speak to me if I listen. Now, I have to pay attention, but he will speak to my heart in a way that I can understand. He is not putting the onus on me to somehow figure this thing out. I do have to do my due diligence and my research and my understanding and, and study and so forth. But if I will slow my heart down and just listen, he'll speak to me very clearly. And I go back to what he said in Job. He spoke to Job very, very clearly when he showed up and spoke, and and, and you don't forget that kind of thing. I am, um, and I think that that that's one of the things I'd like to to spend the rest of the time on this conversation with is is how can we speak clearly into the situation of caregivers? There's a story in the uh, Montreal Gazette. Uh, sorry, by the way, uh, allergies are kicking in here in Tennessee after being in Montana where it's dry and <laughs> arid out there, even though it's in the wintertime. But here, everything's starting to kind of bloom and all this rain. But it's uh, there's a story in the Montreal Gazette about a man who was taking care of his wife with Alzheimer's early onset. And for years, he took care of did everything. And it was crushing him. Uh, he ended up getting fired from his job because he was having to miss so much time and all this stuff. And finally, he just acquiesced and put her into a facility. And yet he would show up and be 
severely questioning the way she was being treated in the facility. And um, she would be strapped into a chair most of the time when he would show up there. Her head would be kind of cocked off on one side. And, and it just became unbearable to watch her become agitated when the, the attendants try to bathe her and things such as that. So he showed up one day and he'd had enough and he put a pillow over her face and he smothered her and killed her. And he's being sentenced uh, here uh, in just a couple of weeks in Canada for uh, manslaughter. My question is, Eric, and I throw this out there, we can just we can just kind of bang this around. In a world filled with uh, in a world that has people like Governor Northam of Virginia in it, mm-hmm. how does that resonate with a guy like this who is watching this? Because Governor Northam says, we're gonna put the child over here and we'll have a discussion after we see to the health of the mother. The child with severe deformities. Well, this guy's seeing his wife over here, and he's wanting to have a discussion about his wife. And everybody got all up in arms about Governor Northam dressing up in blackface or, or having a picture of somebody dressed up in blackface or Ku Klux Klan or whatever. But they all forgot about the horrific, dispatched, cold way that he said, we're just going to have a discussion about this deformed child. And in a world that is increasingly embracing death, how do you speak life to a caregiver who is beyond the breaking point? And the guy, after he did this, he posted on Facebook. He said, nobody asked me how I was doing, and now you know. I mean, it, 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 was, it was almost a... Um, it, it was almost a white flag of surrender that he just held up. He said, I, I'm done. Stick a fork in me. I've, I've, I've crossed the line now. I can't do anything more. She's, I've taken her out. And, but he was so isolated that somehow that seemed like the path he needed to take. I want to read an excerpt from this article. It says, as lawyers have described the case as the personal and intimate story of a man who is broken down by a decade of helplessly witnessing his wife deteriorate. A judge described him as an exhausted caregiver and the killing as an expression of physical, psychological, and moral exhaustion. That's why I do a show. That reason right there. I, and he had, <coughs> he had gone to somebody, a social worker had said in the article, it, as back in 2013, and said he was feeling suicidal and homicidal. Uh, this, is not a, this is not a solitary event. There's a, a lady in Oregon that took out her special needs child. There's a guy over here in West Tennessee, just, just an hour and a half from us, who beat his nonverbal autistic son to death and then told everybody he had run off. And so the community was out looking for this autistic son that had supposedly eloped. And the wife watched him do it. Um, and we're going to hear more and more about this. You're going to hear more and more about people, particularly down in Florida, where a guy, an elderly man is taking care of his wife and he gets a bad diagnosis and then he takes both of them out. Um, That's not a rare thing in scenarios because when when he gets a bad diagnosis and there's nobody to take care of her, he feels like, what am I going to do? You know, and um, I, in a culture that is rushing to embrace death, how do we help these individuals embrace life and speak life into it? And what does it look like? You can't just say, hey, don't do that because you're not giving them an alternative. It's like telling somebody not to get an abortion, but not being willing to help them with the child uh, or provide an alternative of adoption or something. But, but you know, don't kill the baby is not enough. You can't just say, don't kill the baby. You've got to say, here's the path to life. And if we don't do that in a clear, concise manner as a church with great clarity, uh, did you ever see that movie uh, with Mel Gibson uh, about uh, General Hal Moore called We Were Soldiers? Mm-hmm. Spectacular. Hard to watch. But I, I love movies like that because, number one, they're true. Um, but there was a scene when everything was just falling apart, just bullets are flying. It's all just going to hell. And there's no other way to describe it in battle like that. And they did, a, they did a magnificent job of really depicting the horror of war. And into that, General Hal Moore 
his character played by Mel Gibson stood up and he said, okay, we're going to take that Creek bed. We're going to take that hill. And it was very direct, measurable things that we're going to do. We're not going to worry about our taxes. We're not going to worry about five years down the road. This is our objective. And so as Christians, if we don't learn how to speak in that level of clarity to people who are in shell shock, who are just truly uh, horrified at what's going on around them and give them a, a place to rally around and a direction to go, then we're not helping them. And this is what I'm finding with caregivers. I had a lady call into my show since last you and I talk, I believe. And uh, she was terribly afraid uh, because her drug addicted brother was threatening her. Um, and he was a felon and he had a shotgun at his home and her mother was had dementia, but she had enabled this behavior for years. And now this woman is just caught in all this mess. And I told her, I said, look, the fact that he has a weapon and he has a, and he has a record, that's a game changer. And it's time to call in the authorities. There's no need to wait anymore. He's already violated this. And she said, yeah, but he's threatened to expose my background and tell everybody that I used to be a lesbian before I got saved. And I said, let me tell you about Jesus. This Jesus who you profess to know, let me go, let's go a little deeper and tell you what he thinks of your sin and your sexual brokenness. And I said, he only Satan will try to blackmail you. Jesus will never do that. And I said, let the chips fall where they may, but your safety, I would rather this guy let people know what God had rescued you from than for you to be shot because this guy's drug-addled brain has taken him down some dark paths. He needs to be locked up and that deal with the consequences of his behavior so that you can be safe. Your safety is more important than your reputation. Your safety is more important than whatever information this guy's going to do. But that's speaking clarity to this woman. This is your next step. Call the cops. Now, I can't make her do it. I, I, I don't have that power. That's not my job. My job is to point her to what safety looks like. And I did that. This is what we have to do as believers to each other. This fellow that was in Canada, he needed somebody to point him to safety, but nobody showed up. Uh, Governor Northam is pointing people to destruction and to death. That's what he's doing. And make no mistake, and, and he, they can come after me all at one. I know this is live and everybody else is probably, this, who knows what they'll do with this clip. I don't care. That's what he's promoting. But as believers, we have an opportunity to point somebody to life and say, no, 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 no. We're not going to have a discussion about killing the baby. We're going to have a discussion about how to help you all get to a place of safety as a unit. And we're going to care for this child. And uh, what, What's so grievous to me is uh, there's two, two aspects of this. First of all, for this man, in James 2, he says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can that faith save him? If a brother and sister is poorly clothed and lacked, lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? Exactly. We, we just say, brother, we're going to pray for you. Well, what did, <laughs> thanks so much. What do you want me to do with that information? You know, I tell people it's like going to the post office and you're carrying a bunch of boxes. And somebody looks at you, brother, you look to be burdened down. I'm going to pray for you. Well, hold the door while you do it. You know, I mean, honestly, we can do so much more. Keep our thoughts and prayers to ourselves and, and between us and God and let our actions reflect that heart condition. If we don't speak life with clarity, and I'm not talking about, hey, don't do this. It's more to Here's where the path is. Mm -hmm. All you want to just just like this. I mean, just like that guys at the airplane with the lights. They're holding. They're waving them in. Here's where you go. This is what it looks like. I can't make the pilot turn the plane towards the right direction, but I can sure show him where it is. Are we doing that? Are we doing that? Nobody did this for this guy in Montreal. And it it, it it what it does, and what people don't realize that it does, it corrupts our testimony as believers. It absolutely says to the world, and I, you know, I, I don't know the governor, uh, but I'm sure that he will tell you he goes to church on Sunday. 
um, and he's a, uh, a believer. Uh, Como in New York signs full-term abortion is the law of New York now. And, you know, uh, Nancy Pelosi, okay, Speaker of the House, uh, pra- says, Dev- I'm a devout, a devout Catholic, a devout Catholic, and I am in favor of full-term abortion, and I'm in favor of same-sex marriage, and I am a devout not much of a selling point for Catholicism, is it? It corrupts our testimony, and people don't realize that their actions. Look, Abraham, it corrupted his testimony when he passed his wife off as his sister, and God spoke to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh called him out about it. It corrupted his testimony when he passed off his wife as his sister to Abimelech, and God stepped in, and Abimelech called him out on it, and it corrupted his testimony. Okay? He, Abimelech was more afraid of the consequences of God than Abraham was in that particular set of circumstances. All right? He put himself before the needs of God and the trust in God. So he was on a pass-fail basis. Ultimately, in Genesis 22, he passes the ultimate test. But the point is, up until that, he's just like you and I. We're going through a period of testing and trials, testing and trials, testing and trials. All right? And is our, it, it, are, are we showing compassion? to that person that's giving care? Are we offering them? I just had a board member's wife uh, just went through full uh, breast cancer surgery and reconstruction, uh, 11 hours of surgery. And when I went to set up, to send meals, this is, this is he sits on my board. She was my uh, executive assistant uh, in the congregation. Uh, she was my administrator. Um, there was like, I had to, it was almost into March. The surgery was in January. It was almost into March before I could get a meal because so many people had stepped up. That did my heart good to make sure that this family, uh, there was somebody who took charge of it and set up a website and set up a calendar of who was going to be, and people were signing up to, to send meals. You could send, put send money and somebody says, I'll be the one that will provide the meal or you can send you know a fully prepared meal by a company that delivers the fully prepared meals. This is what people need. They need action, not accolades. Well, they do. And it, and it doesn't have to be something complex. It just has to be something clear, a clear, tangible path to safety. When I had this lady with my show, I'm not going to tell her, well, sister, I'm going to pray for you. Actually, after she hung up, when we came back from the break, I called the audience to pray for her. And we are going to. But I told her, call the authorities. That's your next action step. Call the authorities and deal with this reality first. That After that, nothing else matters at this point. Right. She has a, a drug addict brother who is threatening her and has a firearm. At what point do we need to talk about the exegesis of, of, of the book of Hebrews? At that point, we don't. We need to get her to safety. Then we can start whittling down the next action steps. But we absolutely have to help speak clarity in people's lives. When this man is sitting there with a pillow in his hand ready to smother his wife, that is not the time to talk about the five points of Calvinism. That is the time to grab his hands and stop him and stand between that and say, there is another path. Here's where we're going to go and we're going to get you some help. And that's what it was, was a cry for help. The whole thing was a cry for help. And there are millions of caregivers right now. You may be sitting next to one at your, at your job watching this. I know a number of people keep this program on while they're at work uh, that has a situation. And you can give them a word of encouragement and speak into their life. We've been talking to Peter Rosenberger, author of Seven Caregiver Landmines and How You Can Avoid Them, Hope for the Caregiver. Uh, You can find him at caregiverswithhope.com or standingwithhope.com. And he appears here on Revealing the Truth on the last Monday of every month in the 10 o'clock hour. Until we see you again next month, month of March, on actually it'll be March 25th. The calendar is exactly the same, February and March, unusual. But uh, put it on there, give our love to Gracie, and tell her I'm waiting for her. I know. Uh, she, this was her morning to do it, but she's still a little bit 
That's We're sore from traveling, but I we're going to get her into March. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.